You are listening to Harvest Bible Chapel KL. For more information, please visit our website at www.harvestkl.org. And it has significant meaning, as we just heard this story play out, for those who are within the community of faith, for those who are within the church, uh, this is a you are loved type of place. We've been doing a study through the book of Acts, and recently we've been looking at community and what it means to be a part of the church family. What does it mean to be a part of the harvest family of families? How, how do we act? What, what do we do? Or how, how do we respond to circumstances around us? This morning we're going to continue looking at those very things as we study from Acts chapter 6. So grab your Bibles and, and turn there, Acts chapter 6 this morning. We're going to be looking at the unstoppable church and seeing how uh, the church of God is unstoppable when we go about doing things His way in the power of His Spirit. Really this morning as we begin looking at things, we ha- have to ask as we do every week, well, what does it mean to be an unstoppable church? Because it, it very much, uh, when we look around the world, the, look at the world around us, we very much see that many times it seems like the church has stopped. It's not advancing. It's not effective. It's very much stagnant and in trouble. And yet, if we were to return to the principles that God has laid out for His church in the book of Acts, I would suggest that we would become an unstoppable force, as God has intended, as God has already used in the past, if we would but submit ourselves to these things. As we looked at Acts, Acts, we've seen in Acts chapter 2 the power of community, how when the Holy Spirit fell upon them, there was a a response of repentance, and 3,000 people responded that very day, and and they would devote themselves to the apostles' teaching, and to prayer, and to fellowship, and to breaking of bread. These were activities that they were involved in, and if you look at the end of Acts chapter 2, really what you find are about 15 different uh, characteristics of biblical community, of uncommon community, of God's community. We, We advance the story, and we see that there was some uh, there was some persecution, really, that came in Acts chapter 3 and 4, and religious leaders were trying to make the church stop preaching the name of Jesus, and yet when we get to the end of that chapter, there is an amazing prayer meeting that happens. And we studied last week, as we saw last week, we saw this community sharing with one another, stewarding God's, uh, God's things well, advancing the gospel, and in that, we saw an amazing community effect. You see, the way we act as community matters greatly to God. That's what we talked about last week, and this week we're going to continue under that theme and understanding as well to see uh, how, how, much, how much we need to make sure we preserve the relationships that drive the community that, we're, that are within us. And so write this down this morning. This is our driving idea, and if you're taking notes, uh, something that you'll want to write down. Uh, the the statement that will drive us today is that the unstoppable church resolves community conflict now. We get after it. We're, we're urgent about it. There's, there, there's no room for us to allow conflict to simmer and wait and just to tuck it under the rug and not deal with it. But we need to, let's get after it now. And God's Word shows the importance of that as there is conflict that's resolved in, at the beginning of Acts chapter 6. So we're trying to resolve community conflict here today. You do, do you know what the word resolve means? A quick reminder here. Dictionary definition says that it's to settle or to find a solution to a problem or a dispute. It means that we're going to clear up any sort of issue that's, a, that's between us. We're going to find the answer to the problem that it is making it so that we don't like being with each other right now. Because, because does that happen? Does it happen that sometimes I don't like being with the people in my church? It's true, right? Have you ever heard of a conflict happening in a church? Has that ever happened before in this world? You all laugh a little bit, right? It's not a surprise. And unfortunately, in the midst of conflict, there are oftentimes many splits and divides and things that I believe do not bring glory and honor to the Lord in any way. And oftentimes those things stop and hinder 
a church rather than help the mission of Christ advance. Here's the thing I find, though. Conflict happens all the time, and there's no way to actually avoid conflict. We're going to talk about that. So how I deal with this reality, how I deal with the fact that there is going to be conflict, how I resolve conflict is a big deal. Because it's going to exist. Anytime there's two people in a room for longer than a few minutes, there's going to be some different ideas and some feelings and some thoughts expressed. And, all the, and I can't say that all the time that those things will be unified. And so there's going to be conflict, and my question to you is, how do you handle conflict? If, it, if it's going to happen, if, if you can put two people in a room, when you put 200 people in a room, there's going to be conflict, like, how is it that you go about dealing with conflict? There's a lot of different ways, and I just quickly thought of 10, because 10 rolled off the list so very fast about how I have dealt with conflict in poor ways. Here, here are some poor ways that I've dealt with conflict. Tell me if you've ever been a part of conflict dealt with in a poor way like this as well. The first is this. Many times, there's just kind of this anger that happens at the beginning of the conflict, but it sticks around. Listen, God has created us with emotions, and there's some things that should make us angry. I don't think angry in and of itself is a sin. Okay, That's not a sin, but when I I let that linger, and when it moves into a place where I'm so mad that I want to get back at you, that vengeance thing, that's a problem. I'm so mad that I can't let go and forgive you and release you of the obligation that was created when you hurt me. That's our definition of forgiveness, right? When I, I'm so bitter, that, that, that's a poor way to handle conflict. Here's the second one. I, I'm just going to avoid it. I'm just going to avoid it. I'm just going to avoid the person. I'm going to walk in and out that door instead of the one they normally come in. I'm I'm just going to ignore it. I'm going to pretend like it's not there. And I'm going to just stick my head in the sand or under the blanket. And and it just doesn't exist. And, And oh, I'm so spiritual because I'm dealing with conflict by not having the conflict. Is often a poor way to do it. Oftentimes it leads to some sort of silent treatment. Just not going to talk to you anymore, ever again. Here's a third way. Uh, Oftentimes we shame others. We shame them. We find ways that we can undermine who they are and make it known to others that that they're a problem and the problem is them and they are the ones that, right, we, we shame others. Here's number four, we gossip. Man, we, I have this problem with you. Sam, you and I, are, we're, we're, having this, we're having this conflict and I have this problem with you, but I'm not going to tell it to you. Oh no, I'm going to act like nothing's happened there. But man, Doug, can I tell you about how messed up he is? Right? Like, like there's this thing here, and I, but, but let me tell you about him. Let me warn you about him. Let me... Okay, oftentimes that's a, that's a poor response to conflict. We know that. Here's number five, I just get defensive, Right? It becomes this attack thing, and so suddenly I'm on the defensive, and I'm, 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 like, I'm putting up walls, and I'm not building any sort of bridge to another person. I just put up the walls and, and just make sure that that doesn't hurt me anymore. Many times that defensiveness turns into offense, <laughs> where then I'm attacking the person uh, up at number one, right? Here, number six, blame game, right? I just start pointing fingers. It's them, it's them, it's them. Oh, it's them. Oh, can you believe what they think? Can you believe what they say? Oh, it's them, it's them. And we never look at ourselves like there's any... No, I'm perfect, is what we're saying there, right? When we start the blame game. Number seven, I know what they think. I know what they were thinking when they did that. I know what they were thinking when they said that. I can see into their heart and the motivations inside of it, and I know it was evil, right? Oftentimes, that's the way we do it. Number eight, character attack. <laughs> uh, this goes along with some of the other things, but it, do you know how messed up he, he is? Do you, know, do you know what he does? Do you know what he says when he's not in church? Do you know where he was last night? Like character attack, right? Just attack the person. Don't deal with the problem. But let me just attack the person. Make sure they're lower than me. Number nine, <clears throat> here's a great way to resolve conflict. I'm always right. I'm always right. You're wrong. I'm always right. And I just never considered the possibility that I could actually be wrong in this situation. That, that's a poor way of dealing with conflict. And here's number 10. Oftentimes, it just, we just leave. 
I'm out of here. I'm pulling the parachute, jumping out of this plane. I'm never coming back. I'm leaving. Because I, I, somehow we get this spiritual idea that if I didn't have the conflict, if I don't deal with it, if I don't, if I don't work this out, if I don't expend the emotional energy and I just leave, that that's going to actually be better and interesting. None of those options are taught in God's Word when it comes to conflict resolution. None. It's not usually the conflict itself, but how I deal with it that determines the outcome. It's not that there is a conflict that is being had, but how I respond in the conflict that matters the most. It's it's oftentimes what I do in the midst of it that, that is the thing that we really need to work on. So I was doing a little research about conflict this week in various situations and scenario, and I came across this rather wild story because conflict always means that you're rational and calm and do the logical thing, right? No. I, I, you didn't say no fast enough on that one, okay? No, no. Like usually we get to that place of irrational, passionate, not thinking about the outcome, and so we do something that later we look back on and went, why was I even, what, what even happened there? And so a man who hit his wife with a frozen squirrel, was jailed on suspicion of spousal abuse. That's the first line of the news story that I heard. I'm thinking, wait a second, wait a second. There was a frozen squirrel involved? Like like somebody was hunting squirrels and put them in the freezer, and then, I'm so mad, I'm taking the squirrel out! Like like what happened there? Like, Like how we respond in the midst of conflict is like, it matters greatly. And so here's the deal, like we could actually do crazy, irrational, non-biblical, frozen squirrel type of things, or we could look at God's Word and say, hey, what does God's Word say about conflict and how we deal with that? Like, like what are the things that are there that I need to go after? And, And that's where this message is going here this morning. And so let's look at Acts chapter 6 this morning. The Bible teaches how to handle conflict in the church, and you might need to write this down. This sermon, by the way is not intended for any of you individually. This sermon is intended for us corporately. So every once in a while, we do ser- most of the time we do sermons, and it, and it impacts you, and there's like individual things that God's Spirit is trying to do. But can I suggest that this sermon is kind of like an us thing? Like, like it's going to require some individual responsibility on everybody's part, but really it's, it's how we all together respond to this particular message this morning. And so Acts chapter 6, um, resolving community conflict... An unstoppable church resolves community conflict now. There's an urgency to it. Now. We're going to deal with it now. Because God doesn't want these things to to, to hinder us in any way. And so write this down this morning. We must resolve spiritual and physical needs. When it comes to our community as as a body of believers, there's some physical things, there's some spiritual things that are going on, and, and, and let me show you this. We, we resolve spiritual needs for sure, but there's physical needs involved. There's some very practical things is what God's Word, I believe, is saying here. And so Acts chapter 6, verse 1 says this, Now, in the days when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. Here we go. We see in God's Word, um, no perfect church. And the church at the very beginning of Acts was also not perfect by any means. And what we find here is a complaint comes up. There's a, there's a problem that needs to be resolved. And notice here it says that it was a complaint by the Hellenist. Like, who are the Hellenists? Like, that's a weird name, right? So, got to understand this. The Hellenists were a group of Jewish people who were living in uh, places outside of the land of Palestine. They were living outside of the Canaanite land. They were living outside of the land that God had given to them. And so their culture, many times, has been mixed with uh, other, in this case, Roman uh, Empire is going on. So Greek-speaking, Greek culture places. So if you were from the island of Cyprus and you were a Jew, you would come every year to the Passover celebration in, in, in Jerusalem. And that's what just happened, right? Jesus was crucified. A number of weeks later, then the day of Pentecost happens, and they're all still there, and they hear what goes on about the, uh, the testimony of the apostles. Many of them believe they're all part of the church, and there's a lot of Greek-speaking, Greek-cultured people still in Jerusalem, part of this church of about 20,000 people right now, who, who in the midst of it, there's widows who need to be cared for. 
there's just a very practical thing that's going on. The church is take care, taking care of some physical needs. And, and in that, there were some of the widows were not being given their fair share. They were being overlooked. They, were, they, they just weren't being... What was supposed to be happening, the, the care they were supposed to have, wasn't happening. And, and instead, there were like Hebrew, there were the, 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 the Jewish people from the land of Israel there that were part of the church, their widows were getting everything they needed. And, and do you see how that's not... Anybody think that... Who thinks that's not fair? Raise your hand if you think that's not fair. Yeah, that's not fair, right? Wait a second. There, there's this divide here between what widows are getting things and what widows are not. And, and so what we see here is that this daily distribution, there's a daily care for physical things that's going on. And the church needs to resolve the physical needs within itself. So many conflicts are related to practical, daily, physical problems. There's just needs that, are met, that need to be met. There's just things that need to be taken care of. And, and in this, we see an example of how the church is doing this. Now, this text is not about caring for the widows and orphans. It's not a teaching on that per se. It's really about a conflict that's going on and the way that leadership resolves it. However, in this, an important link is being established. We see here this fledgling brand new church that was just came into being on the day of Pentecost. And we see them as they're growing in their understanding. Remember, they're devoted to the apostles' teaching and to the breaking of bread and they're meeting together. As they're doing that, we find here what is a, called in, the, in, in James a true religion. Understand that a religion without works is dead, right? Our faith without works is dead. And, and so show me a faith that doesn't have works, I'll show you a dead religion. And, and this church was not a dead religion. They were taking care of the needs. They were taking care of the physical things that were going on there. And as a church, we have to recognize our responsibility is not just in the spiritual realm, although... I believe that to be first and foremost, but very much in the practical needs, and this first church is demonstrating that. The problem comes with there's not an equality. There's a, some people are being missed in that, and there's an important reason we have to think about, but I also want to point out to you that even as we resolve physical needs, we can't do it in absence of resolving the spiritual needs of somebody as well. The reality is every conflict reveals a spiritual need. Every time you have a fight with your parents, it resol- it's revealing a spiritual need. Every time you have a disagreement with your spouse, it's a spiritual need that needs to be taken care of. And what happens in the seen world is really revealing the truth about what's happening in the unseen world, in the spiritual world. And so what we see here, there's a spiritual component to this very practical problem that's going on here. It's not just that widows aren't being given their fair daily share. It's that the witness of the church is going down and being diminished because people are looking and they're seeing a conflict. And if this conflict doesn't get resolved, do you want to go to this church that's fighting about it? Anybody want to go to a church that's fighting about stuff? Nobody wants to go to that church, right? So God's glory being diminished, that, that's a spiritual problem. That's, a, that's, that's something that can't be ignored, but rather should be dealt with. And so what we see here is not just a practical problem, a physical problem, but a spiritual one as well. We just looked at this video that talked about you are loved and how much it matters. It's not something we can just say, but it's something we have to live out. We've been called to this because we've been called to a ministry of reconciliation. We've read about it already in Colossians today, but let me point you again to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, where in verse 18 it says this, All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to Himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ God was reconciling the world to Himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. I mean, this is an important concept. We have been given reconciliation with God, and then God then gives us the the message, the mission, to help others be reconciled to Him. So how is it that a church that is disunified and fighting and not resolving their issues, how is it possible for them to reconcile others to God when they are in disarray because of disunity? You see, our unity matters. 
and resolving conflict that is going to happen. It's not that whether or not you have the conflict, it's going to happen. Resolving it matters greatly because we've been given a ministry of reconciliation. We've been given the ministry to help others see that they're lost and separated from God. Like, I don't know where your standing is today with the Lord. You may have, had, had, you may have walked with God for a very long time. Or, or it's possible that you're here today and you've only walked with Him for a few days and weeks. Or maybe you're even just trying to figure it out still. Somebody dragged you to church and it's like, I, I hear this every week. What, what is this thing with Jesus that you guys are always singing about and praying about? And why is it that we're always talking about that? And it's clear in these verses that God, who through Christ reconciled us to Himself, those are powerful words. You see, we're all born with sin. <laughs> we're all born with a separation from God. We, we, we sin, and, and because God is holy and we then are not, there's a separation that happens. God is in His justice and perfection and love condemns those who are apart from Him to an eternity without Him. We often call that hell. And in this today, I would want you to hear that God through Christ Jesus has provided reconciliation. If you're here today and your soul is restless and and you wonder where is it that this God thing fits and you're trying to figure out why is it that people are so sold on Jesus Christ it's because he's, rec- he, he's paid the price and He's bought us and He's done everything is re- that's required by God so that we could have relationship with God if we would but have faith and belief in Him. So has that happened ever in your life? Has there ever been a moment? Just think about it right now. This is something that we need constantly to remind ourselves of. Has there ever been a moment where you have been reconciled to God? You were His enemy because of sin. But one day you believed Christ who took upon that sin and paid it for you and put His righteousness on you so that now you have salvation. Has that ever happened? It could happen today if it doesn't. If God's working in your heart right now, don't turn that off. He's given us the ministry of reconciliation to help you understand that this is possible. And God would desperately want to come into relationship with you if you would but believe in Jesus Christ for salvation. Let God's Spirit work on you as we preach here this morning, as we pray, as we worship. And if God's doing something, get around somebody who knows Christ already and ask Him for some help getting clarity on that. We would desperately want to help you in those things. Here's the deal. God has made it a priority to reconcile, to restore, to to make things right in conflict. He's made that way through through Jesus Christ for Himself, and then He's calling us together to be reconciled to each other in any relationships here so that we could help others be reconciled to God. And in that, I want you to see the priority of conflict resolution. Is there any conflict that's going on right now in the church between you and another person or a group of people? Is there anything that you have hard feelings and it's hard to have a conversation with and I would have a difficult time sharing in small group with because of something that has hurt you or some way that you have hurt somebody else? See, what happens in the physical world reveals what is true in the spiritual world. And that's why God wants you to see the priority of making things right here in this physical world. Listen, if there's something that's going on with, between somebody here in the church and you, like, don't let that ha- like, get that taken care of today. Maybe even before you walk out the doors, you just tap somebody on the shoulder and say, I-, I just need to work something through with you today. And listen, if you get tapped on the shoulder, you respond with great grace and welcome and say, yes, let's get this figured out. Because it matters greatly to God. It, it matters greatly to the witness of the world around us. There's a priority to get these things taken care of today. So the unstoppable church resolves community conflict and and we've got to take care of this. There's a priority to it, but here, write this down. Number two, we must resolve organizational breakdown. See, a lot of times conflict happens not just because there's a because there's an interpersonal thing going on, but sometimes there's a structural thing within our church that we have to take care of as well. And so what we see here, uh, continue reading in, in Acts chapter six, 
So, uh, verse 2, it says, And the number, and the twelve summoned the full number of the disciples and said, It is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the Spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and the ministry of the word. Fascinating here. It says in verse 1 that there was an increasing number of people coming to the church. We know 120 people were in the room praying and then 3,000 on the day of Pentecost. At the, in chapter 4, we saw that 5,000 men were added to that number. So then you start thinking about their families as well. There's probably about 20,000 people. In Acts chapter 5, verse 14, it says that there were multitudes of them. The Word of God uses multitudes when there's lots, right? Lots and lots. There's, there's thousands of people in here and it, is called a, it has caused a crisis the leadership crisis that we see in verse 2 here is that we can't do what we're supposed to do and keep up with this increase that's going on in the church. And so they said, listen, we can't keep up with it. There's a problem that we have to deal with. But, but in that, we recognize the priority that we have to pray and to preach over administration. And that's not to say the apostles weren't involved in administration. Actually, up to this point, apparently they were. They were working hard on the, the details of putting the ministry together and keeping 20,000 people and, and the widows fed. They were just, there was just so much of it going on. It was so much bigger than what they could do. That, isn't it good when leaders say, it's too much. It's beyond me. So many times in the world, it's like, no, I can do it, man. I'm a, I'm a great leader. I can handle it all. And that's foolishness. It's good when our leaders say, listen, we've, we've grown to a point past where our ability is and we're going to need to get some other help involved here and that's what we see going on here. Our church leaders can be busy with administration and care to the point of neglect of spiritual leadership. Does anybody see that as a problem? That if our leaders were so involved in the administration and the care of people that then we got to the sermon time and it was like, you know what, we don't, just, let's just pray today. Let's do testimony Sunday. We don't really have anything prepared for you. The worship team stands up and they're like, hey, welcome to Harvest today. We want to worship, but we were so busy caring for people in the administration that we don't have any songs prepared. Anybody have a song they want to sing? Like That would be a problem. And what happens here is many times we can overwhelm people with things that are not their priority job, and in that becomes the neglect where we are at. I mean, have you ever felt, have you ever started to feel overwhelmed? I know the answer to this question, right? Was there ever any, any part of your week this week where it was like, ah, oh, it's crazy. I'm not sure how I'm going to get, like, I see the smiles, and I knew who was overwhelmed this week, right? Because right behind those smiles, there were tears at some point because I'm so overwhelmed. I know I'm supposed to get this done, and I want to be responsible, but I just can't get... That's where the apostles were. The apostles recognized that they were at a spot where they needed to give some leadership responsibility to others, and so their solution was to give delegation to next-level leaders. They realized they can't do it on their own, and it's too big. And so they begin to delegate to a second level leadership. And many times this text is used as demonstration as the first deacons of a church. Now that's not what they're called. And, and really there's, uh, there, there's the, the working out perhaps of a deacon type of role. But that's not, this text isn't even talking about deacons necessarily. It's just saying that the leaders had a priority for spiritual things that was being overwhelmed by the physical things. And so the proper response here was, listen, when there was organizational breakdown... We're going to get some help. We're going to get the right help. And we're going to solve the problem that that is at hand through delegating to others. Notice here that they do pick six men. It says here in verse 5, what they said pleased to the whole gathering. And so they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenius, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. A proselyte is somebody who had converted to the Jew-Israelite faith and then found Christ. Now he's converted to Christianity as well. And so what we see here, it's interesting. Seven men, did you notice? Did you notice? They all have Greek names. They all have Greek names. So, so the, the, the Greek-speaking Jewish Christians who, who, whose widows were not being taken care of are now going to be taken care of by seven men with Greek names, probably Greek-related like, like the apostles in this. 
Okay, listen, the, the choice that, uh, of who they were giving was directly related to the issue at hand. And seven capable men were being given. Notice here the qualifications. We don't just delegate to anybody. Notice here, they didn't look for the, 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 the guy who had the best Jerusalem food service business and said, let's give it to him and hand it to him. No, 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 no. What they found was men who were spiritually qualified for the task. Notice what it says here. They were of good repute. Do you see that? Verse 5. They were of good repute. They had a good reputation for doing good works. These were seven guys who were already proven in their ability to do good works among the body of believers. It wasn't just some brand new, uh, just getting started type of Christian. These guys were proven in their abilities already. Secondly, they were full of the Spirit. It says here that they were spiritually mature and Holy Spirit directed. These are the kind of people that we look for to take the spot of leadership. And then finally it says they were full of wisdom. Wisdom, the biblical word wisdom, is really the idea of living skillfully. So so they were living lives full of skill and and how to live life well. They, they, They weren't losers. They weren't bums. They weren't inactive. These were guys who were skillful in how they lived life, and so there was a reputation that was looked up upon for that as well. And what we see here is really the beginning of how we choose spiritual leadership in any church. Later in the pastoral epistles, we know that there are qualifications for elders and deacons and those who are leading women in the church. And what we find is that when there is an overwhelming workload for those who are responsible for spiritual things in the physical realm, we need to find spiritually qualified people to delegate that task to as the apostles did. What we find here is that they were commended by the congregation and affirmed by the apostles who were playing an elder role at that point into these things. And here's my question for you this morning. Are you ready? Are you ready to step up into some sort of leadership in our church? Are you ready to take on some of the tasks that would allow those who have spiritual care for your souls to concentrate more fully on those things while you take care of some of the physical and spiritual needs within our congregation? Would you be ready for that if we came and one of our elders tapped you on the shoulder and said, hey, we're looking for somebody to actually take care of some things for us. Uh, Would you be willing to do that? Are you proven Are you growing in your spiritual maturity? I'm not saying you've arrived in all things, but you're growing in your spiritual maturity. You're listening to the Holy Spirit in your life. Are you skilled in life? You can handle some of the load that's being given here. You see, we need, we need in our church people who can actually step into those types of leadership roles. And I'm just simply asking from the front today one broad general question Are you ready? Are you prepared? And what would it take to get you to that spot if you're not so that you could step in and take care of some of the needs within our church? Listen, I'm not saying you need a second part-time job. I'm not saying we need to overwhelm you with things to do. I'm just saying, would you serve your Lord in the ministry of reconciliation through the church that He is the head of and that He desperately wants to use in an unstoppable way to make the Gospel known here on this earth? Would you be ready for that? We actually have something coming to help you with that, by the way. Next Tuesday night, the 28th of March, you need to clear your schedule and calendar and come and be a part of what we have titled. This is just the the, the snazzy title, right? It's called Equipped to Advance. We're we're putting on a two-hour seminar. We're bringing a man from one of the Harvest Churches in the U.S. to come and to lead our seminar. He's He's a fantastic leader. It's what he does in his profession, but he's currently an elder in his church, and he currently leads a, a campus of one of the churches in the Denver, Colorado area. And so Dale Hansen is going to come next Tuesday night and do a leadership seminar. And our desire as an elder team is that if you in any way currently serve somewhere in our church, that you would come and be a part of this night. And if you're not serving anywhere in our church, that you would come and just say, I, I want to grow, I want to learn, I, I want to grow up into these things. Now, I know that Tuesday night isn't like the most convenient time, but here's the thing. Leaders get to things even when it's not most convenient because leading is never convenient. And I would encourage you to to make space, make room, and and come to be a part of this night and and still go to small group that week. Whoa, that's a concept. Whoa, pastor, that's one too far. So, but 
but you get what I mean, right? Come to our Equip to Advance next Tuesday night and grow so that you can step into servant leadership into our church. And then here, here's the final thing. Listen, we need to take care of the needs of our church. We need to have leaders in our church to be able to do that. But this is the main thing right here. Write this down, number three. We must resolve community conflict. Now, now, now. We, we, we just can't let that go. Like, it's so important to get it taken care of. We must resolve community conflict. The realization is, and I've said this a number of times now, conflict will happen. Conflict, I looked this up in the dictionary, by the way. You're thinking, what is conflict? I, I think you know what it is. But here, let me define it a little bit more for us. It's the state of disharmony. Love that. You ever heard a song that doesn't go together, right? You ever heard like your kid was just beginning to learn the saxophone or the trumpet or the violin and you, you know what I'm talking about? That disharmony thing right there? Okay? Like hard on the ears, want to get out of the room, don't want to be a part of that. Okay? The state of disharmony that results from different beliefs, values, and customs. That's what conflict is. In a room where like 30 different nationalities are represented, is it possible that there are different beliefs, values, and customs? Absolutely, right? Absolutely. And I thank God for you because by and large, we work hard at the grace to extend to one another, to be together united. You, you do a fantastic job in so many ways in that already, but I'm just telling you it's possible that's going to come up again. Oh, my pastor, he's so American. Yeah, I'm not getting over that one. <laughs> you know, like we're going to have to deal with some things in that, right? And we've got to work together in these things. In that, notice the interpersonal conflict is not usually, or I'm sorry, interpersonal conflict is not unusual. We need to have a robust understanding that, interpers- that conflict happens wherever people live and work and commune with each other. Bill Heibel, one of the pa- popular pastors in the United States, has a fantastic understanding of this. He said it this way, The popular concept of unity is a fantasy land where disagreements never surface and contrary opinions are never stated with force. We expect disagreement, forceful disagreement. Let's not pretend we never disagree. Let's not have people hiding their concerns to protect a false notion of unity. Let's face the disagreements and deal with it in a godly way. The mark of community True biblical community is not the absence of conflict. It's the presence of a reconciling spirit. Listen, I read that to you because he said it so much better than I ever could. The the mark of true community is not the absence of conflict. It's the presence of a reconciling spirit. It's the presence of, listen, these things are going to happen, but I love the Lord and I love the church and I love you so much that that I'm going to take the time and put the effort into the reconciling that needs to happen here, the restoring that needs to go on. I would have you notice that in verse 1, it says that the complaint was against two very different cultures. Did you notice that? There was the Greek-speaking culture, there's the Hebrew-speaking culture, and in this we have a cross-cultural disagreement happening. And we have God's principles then for how to actually, actually work these out. Another commentator, Young Lee Hertig, said this, The cost of unresolved conflict can be enormous. When accumulated, conflict brews to the boiling point and results in violent eruptions. Therefore, dealing with conflict openly and in an orderly way is significant as demonstrated by the apostles and the Hellenists. His comment on this section of Scripture. What we have here is an understanding that community conflict has two possible outcomes. Remember, conflict's going to happen, but but how we deal with it will lead to two very different paths. And and so what I have for you here is a chart. I need need the chart up on the screen. I have a chart. You look at the conflict, and listen, if we want to get to a place of growth, we need to go from proactive leadership to conflict resolution to growth in relationships to growth in our church. But notice the other option. The other option, headed downwards, we can have passive leadership, we can have conflict escalation, and damaged relationships, and a damaged church. Notice here, listen, 
This, this is a chart by a guy who talks about multicultural teams, and, and he's not even talking about the Christian context. He's just talking about how this happens. If you have conflict, it's an opportunity for two things. One is growth, and the other is damage. How you do it, how you handle it, how you resolve it, res- makes the result in where it goes. So these things are vastly important to know. How did the apostles go about so that there was growth in the church? Because that's what we're going to see rather than damage to the church. So write these things down. I have seven things that I noted from, scripture, from, the, from the Scripture here. This is how we are to deal and resolve with community conflict. Number one, we are to treat everybody with equality. People are different. Look around you for a second. Look down the aisle. Turn, look the other way for a second. Are there, is there anybody the same like you in the aisle at the moment? No, there is not. <laughs> People are different, but note this, none are superior and none are inferior. That's not a biblical worldview in any way. We're all equal in value and therefore should be treated equally. So it doesn't matter if you have a lot of stuff or you don't have very much. It doesn't matter what your shape is, what your skin color is, what your eye color, it doesn't matter. Nobody is better than the other as a result of those things. Scripture is so very clear on this. You may need Galatians chapter 3, verse 28. Notice here, it says, there is neither Jew nor Greek in God's kingdom. There's no ethnic distinction in God's kingdom. So the fact that we come from 30 different nationalities in the room doesn't matter to God. There's nobody better nationality-wise in this room than the other. That's not how God sees it. It says, there is neither slave nor free. Listen, it doesn't matter what your economic situation is. It doesn't matter if you have a lot of wealth or you don't have anything at all. It doesn't matter. Christ sees us all equally here. There's neither male nor female. Listen, there's no gender distinction. Not when it comes to salvation in Christ. There's nobody of less value here. We uphold all with equal value in that. Why? For you are all one in Christ Jesus. Listen, if you are in Christ Jesus, who here today is in Christ Jesus? They're a believer of Jesus. If you're in Christ Jesus, He doesn't see any of those distinctions among you because we're all equal and therefore we need to treat people equally. Here's the second thing. We need to see with sensitivity. It says in chapter uh, chapter 6, verse 1, that the Hebrews, uh, or the complaint was risen by the Hellenists against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the day. Neglected. Nobody was purposefully trying to hurt the widows. It was just a matter of neglect in there because there was a need for sensitivity to be seen in the situation. We need to be sensitive to the needs of others, especially to those who are disadvantaged. It's so easy when they're disadvantaged to run somebody over, and in this, it requires sensitivity of us to be able to see the problem, to look out for others, to see what is going on within the other person. And notice, they did this in the midst of the complaint, right? The complaining was already happening. The issue was already being brought up. And, and, and listen, many times we get into a conflict and it's like I hear the complaint and I'm like I shut down. I get hard and cold. And I, Listen, no, no, no. With sensitivity, we need to hear what the other person is saying, what the other group is saying here. Number three, notice what the apostles did. They discovered the core problem. We need to discover that we need to become knowledgeable in what's going on. It says, therefore, brother, I, I'm sorry. It says in verse two, And the twelve summoned the full number of the disciples and said, they brought everybody together. All of them were together having this conversation. Like, everybody was being represented. Nobody was being left out. And because the apostles brought them all together to discover what's going on. It doesn't say it in this passage, but think about what was going on in that environment. There was for sure a lengthy conversation. There was time to sort it out. There was separating fact from fiction. And in this, can I remember so many times, this is the stage when all the emotion is being vented, right? And like, I'm so hurt. And, and we're, we're so, like, we're being overlooked and nobody sees us and we're starving and doesn't anybody care? And listen, the emotion, while I go low in mine, in the story is going very high at this very moment. And good leaders wade through emotion and don't get caught up in it because they're sensitive. They're discovering. They recognize it's not about them, but the problem. Here's number four. Act according to your ability. 
act according to your ability. Be helpful according to your ability and understanding. I remember one time we went on a trip. It was a ministry trip, a missions trip, and there was a gentleman on the trip who um, said that he could play a musical instrument as part of our ministry, and, and so we were all prepared for him, and he stood up in front of everybody, and he couldn't play. He couldn't play. I was like, wait a second, what's going on here? We thought for sure, like, you were the music guy, and, like, I don't know what was going on. Some, some fantasy in his mind made him think that he was going to lead us in the musical worship at the time, and he couldn't play the instrument. Like, he didn't have the ability. He shouldn't have even been there doing that. And in this, we've got to recognize, what, are the, what is my ability? Like, there's some things I can't get involved in. I don't have that ability. I'm just not involved in that yet. I, it's the wrong place, the wrong time. But when it is the right place and time, use that ability then for sure, right? And so the apostles here understand their authority and limitation. They understand we're the ones that have been given charge to pray and to preach, to do spiritually regarded things. And, and that's the thing that we need to be, that we have the ability for that. But our ability, listen, it's gone past our ability to take care of the physical things here. The church has grown to 20,000 people and we can't care for the widow program any longer on our own. We need some help. And it takes some humility to do that. It takes a security and understanding who you are to know where to be involved and where not. Notice here, they're not micromanaging the situation. They're handing it over to others who could actually do the job. This is so much of an instruction for how we do this. Here's number five. Mediate without taking offense. You know what it means to mediate? It's to get in between two fighting parties, okay? Two disagreements, and to get in between that and to take care of... Okay, so parents, you know what this is, right? You got two kids and they're they're hollering at each other, right? They're they're upset at each other, and like you step in and we gotta we gotta get this taken care of, right? And, and you're the mediator, you're the one that's gonna bring the peace to the situation that's going on here. And so mediate without taking offense. We need to graciously help others through the conflict. And to do that, that's gonna require on our part, <laughs> it's gonna require on our part a security and understanding of who we are and what our place is in the situation. I'm not here to take sides. I'm not here to make things worse. I'm, I'm here to help things get better. And so I'm the one that, listen, so many times we get into this and into the conflict and we become part of the problem, right? I get my emotions raised and I take a side and I think they're right and, and, and it like all goes to pieces at that point. And, and if you're a mediator, listen, know your ability, know what you can step into and not. But in this, we, have, we understand that bringing peace is an important thing. I noted here that the apostles are not offended that the problem emerged under their leadership. Do you see that? Do you see any offense of the apostles here? I think this is a key thing. Rather, they took control and they led the community through a corrective process. That's a powerful thing. They mediated well. And then number six, we need to delegate appropriately. We've talked a bunch about this already, but let me just show you here. Uh, They solved the problem with those involved. They got seven Greek-speaking men to get involved in the Greek widow problem, and they took care of what was going on there. The apostles did not make a unilateral decision. Rather, they backed off and delegated and got others involved and publicly affirmed those who they were even delegating the task to at that time. And then finally... They checked for agreement. Notice here in verse 5 and 6, it says, And what they said pleased the whole gathering. And they chose the men, right? And then in 6 it says, These they set before the apostles, and they prayed, and they laid hands on them. Listen, everybody was pleased with the outcome. They were in agreement with what happened. And when we're involved in, community, in, in resolving community conflict, make sure both sides agree to the solution. And listen, in this, we have to, if we're in the conflict, we have to be honest, right? It's over. I'm done. It's not coming up anymore. Or you know what? I still have hard feelings. If you still have hard feelings, don't walk away. Don't do the passive-aggressive thing. Don't fall into one of the poor ways of dealing with leadership we talked about beforehand. Be honest and work it through. The apostles achieved buy-in from everybody that was here. So here's my question as we end. Will you resolve conflict God's way? Because conflict for sure is going to happen. It's not if it happens or not, but when it happens, how are you going to go about resolving conflict? Will you resolve conflict in God's way? Which 
Quite honestly, think about your heart for a second. Don't think about anybody else but yours. It's possible that you may need to repent of your former way of dealing with conflict. That really the list at the beginning of the message is how I do things way more often than the list at the end of the message. I know my heart was caught on some of these things this week. And it was a place that we need, a play, the place we need to go is to repentance, to change my mind about my actions and, and allow God to transform me to do it differently. I need to repent of my form. Do you need to repent of any way of dealing with conflict? And then secondly, do you need to embrace and put into, God's, into action God's way? This is a very clear conflict in the church. It's going to stop the church, but the church was unstoppable because they did things God's way. Will you do things God's way and resolve community conflict? When? When do we reserve community conflict? Now. Now. The unstoppable church resolves community conflict now. And then finally here, look at the results. Just look at the verse 7. Summary of the whole first section of the book of Acts. This is the summary statement of everything that has happened so far. We're moving into a new section when we continue the, book, continue the story in chapter 6. But for this one, the summary statement is, and the, do you have your eyes on verse 7? Look at it, look at it. And the Word of God continued to increase. And the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. Wow! Wow! It's an unstoppable church. When the Holy Spirit is unleashed and they begin to do things God's way, responding in God's way, repenting in God's way, when they get in line with God's plan for the community as we talked about today, it is an unstoppable force in the world. And the Word of God will multiply. Interesting. The character of God revealed right here in these pages gets told to many other people when we're unified. And the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem. Listen, our city, the multiplication of disciples in Kuala Lumpur happens when we resolve community conflict. And a great many of the priests, listen, the religious guys who hated Jesus and put them on the cross, are now weeping in repentance and following after their Savior, Jesus Christ. That's an unstoppable church. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank You so much for the privilege it is to be called Your church, to be gathered together as Your family, to become sons and daughters of You because of Jesus Christ. Oh Lord, we, we need to live up to Your calling in our lives, and so we ask that You would help us to live as the community that You designed is supposed to. And Lord, we recognize today, humbly, and with heavy hearts, that there's conflict that happens when we're together with brothers and sisters in Christ. Lord, help us. Of course, we would want to not be involved in conflict, but Lord, when it happens, would You help us to resolve it as You have laid forth in Scriptures? Help us to repent of wrong ways of dealing with with conflict and help us to walk in the new ways that You have even provided in this. Lord, we ask that not so that we would be known as great, but because You then would be known as great. Because then there would be increased and multiplied disciples and many who are against You who would follow after You as Your Spirit does its work through us. Lord, You're a great God. And so we worship You and ask that You would work with, in us in these things. It's in Christ's name that I pray. Amen. Thank you.